Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Rehan, and I'm here to teach you about the wonder of statistics. Whoa, 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 wait a minute here. I'm wondering, who the heck are you? I'm Rehan, I just said that. This is my talk, mister. It's called How to Lie with Statistics. Why would you want to teach people how to lie with statistics? People lie with statistics all the time. What are you talking about? Besides, I didn't make this up. There's a whole book about it. You know what he says in the book? The crooks already know these tricks. The honest person needs to learn them in self-defense. You do need to learn these things. You need to learn about human psychology, about your perceptions, how they can be manipulated. Uh, I hope you're going to talk about basic statistics. That's what I was going to talk about. Well, tell you what, why don't you stay up here? You can do the boring part, all right? Let's, let's move on. I'm Evan. And I'm Rehan. And, and we're, we're here, here to, to teach, teach you how, how to, not lie, to with lie with statistics. OK, hold on. I can't go along with this, though. We're not just here to defend ourselves, right? The people at this conference are creators. And as creators, we have responsibility to not mislead people and to add some rigor. Look, we're all adults here. People are going to make their own decisions. I've been in this business for 30 years. You don't know what it's like out there. Sometimes you just got to take a little walk on the dark side. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Besides, what you and I do, is that really lying? Like, when people talk about lying, this is probably what they have in mind. Researchers making up data out of thin air. Engineers rigging the system to produce bogus results. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes lying. The great thing about data and statistics is you don't have to lie. It's all a matter of just finding the right point of view. So it's not lying. It's more like prevarication. I think prevarication just means lying, doesn't it? Oh, no, 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 no. Prevarication, it's more like finding your own way to your own truth. Maybe taking the scenic route on the way there. Listen, Vegas is the perfect place for prevarication. Vegas specializes in psychology. Vegas is also the perfect place to talk about statistics, because in Vegas they understand the power of statistics. But first, what is statistics? It's the science of learning from data and of measuring, controlling, and communicating uncertainty. It is crucial guidance in determining what information is reliable and which predictions can be trusted. Sure, sure, I like that. Measuring, learning, reliable, trusted. These are all good things. These are things you want to associate yourself with. Basically, what statistics gives you is instant credibility. Imagine you got a product you want to sell, the Faberstat 2000. How are you going to pitch it? Well, you could say, buy it. It's good. Or try this. A nationwide survey of households finds that the Faberstat 2000 improves the quality of your life by 95%. Whoa! That's pretty compelling, don't you think? Injecting a little bit of statistical know-how can make your results seem more trustworthy. Who wouldn't want that? Now, of course, you being the intelligent, sophisticated folks that you are, you wouldn't be taken in by such a shallow ploy, right? You're perfectly rational when it comes to weighing evidence, right? None of you are playing the slots or craps or roulette while you're here, right? It's perfectly rational. He looks a little bit, you're looking a little bit guilty there. So clearly not all of us are rational 100% of the time. What's going on here? Why are we rational some of the time and not rational other parts of the time? I'll start with an example. I'm going to tell you about someone, and then I'm going to ask you to answer some questions after. So this is Ashley. And Ashley is 28 years old. She's intelligent, spontaneous, and outspoken. She majored in philosophy, and she's concerned with social justice. She recently participated in an anti-nuclear demonstration. So, 
given this information, which of the following is more likely? A, Ashley's an accountant, or B, Ashley's an accountant and active in the feminist movement? I'll give you a second to think about it. Does anyone want to shout out their answer? Hey, smart audience. If you're like most people, you thought to yourself, it's got to be B. I didn't mention anything that people associate with accountants, but I did mention a lot of things that people associate with feminists, like that she's outspoken and politically active. Based on stereotypes, a lot of people's brains would have associated this information with B. B was constructed to do this, but if we take a step back and take it apart a little bit, we'll notice that B is actually more specific than A. Ashley is an accountant and active in the feminist movement. If this is a set of all accountants, then the set of feminist accountants must be the same size or smaller. It's impossible for that to be bigger than A. So the answer is A. Now, if you didn't get this, I don't want you to feel too bad. Most people get this wrong, and when this question was asked to graduate students in statistics, they got it wrong a third of the time. So what's going on here? Well, psychologists have separated our thinking into two modes, fast and slow, or system one and system two. System one is kind of intuitive, and that's the one that might have drawn you toward B, while system two is slow and rational. System one runs in the background all the time, and system two is there when you engage it. System one relies on shortcuts. This can lead to biases, it draws heavily on stereotypes, and it can make errors, while system two derives its conclusions from data. Now, if I asked you, which one of these do you think you use more often, what would you, what would you say? Unfortunately, the answer is one. System two is just too slow. Further, it's tiring. System two thinking gets your pulse rate up and your blood pressure up. You have to engage it. It requires your focus. You just can't use system two for everything, and there's only so much system two thinking you can do before you crap out. Right. You know, you can use this. System two thinking is cumbersome. It's draining. It's slow. System one thinking feels good. You're like, I'm making connections. I get it. Have you ever found yourself scrolling through page after page of stories that have been algorithmically optimized to tell you what you want to hear? That's system one. So that's where you got to aim your sales pitches, squarely at system one. System two will come along late to the party. It'll come up with some reason to go along with it. Speaking of which, speaking of parties, did you know that drinking is a system two inhibitor? Maybe if you're lucky, tomorrow night, you'll see some failures of system two. <laughs> so if you can associate your product with statistics, credibility just comes right along for the ride. Wait a minute. How did you get this incredible result in the first place? Where did the data come from? Where did the data come from? You're asking the wrong question. Let me tell you a little bit about my process. First, you got to start with a story. What story am I trying to tell? What angle am I going to take? What conclusion am I trying to reach? Then, you can collect data to support that conclusion. That's completely backwards. That's like upside down and inside out. You have to start with the data, and then you use it to find the truth. Get serious. Some of us have a job to do around here. We got a product to sell, an agenda to push, candidate to get elected. Where are your ethics? Where's your integrity? Yeah, I can't find it either. Look, if we don't make decisions based on evidence, then we're going to make bad decisions. We have to follow the facts where they lead. Facts. There's no such thing as facts anymore. Didn't you know that? Remember Ashley? It's not Ashley. She's Petra. She's a software engineer at Tableau. She works right down the hall. All right, that's true. All right. Look, you got your facts, I got mine. Look, why don't we just move on? We're going to agree to disagree. 
I think we can both agree that we have to get the data at some point, right? Right. So in this case, how do we get this data? We did a survey. Let me demonstrate how you do a survey. How many of you believe this conference has improved the quality of your life? Go ahead, raise your hands. How many of you think this conference has decreased the quality of your life? Guards, have them removed. See, that was a survey. You find a population of interest, like all the people in this room, or say, everyone in the United States, and you ask them your question. You want to ask everyone in the United States a question? It's going to cost a fortune, and you're going to spend your, the rest of your life doing it. Look who's Mr. Practical now. What you need is to sample the population. You sample a smaller group of Americans, and then you ask them the question, and then you can calculate that if you'd asked the entire population, that you would have gotten a similar result. But first, you need a list of everyone in America. How are you going to do it? Well, you could look in the phone book and get all the numbers out of it, but that only covers people with landlines. People with cell phones aren't going to be in there. Are people who have cell phones going to answer your question differently than people with landlines? Maybe. Or you could use a list of street addresses, but that doesn't cover people who don't live in incorporated cities. So are the people who are not in those boundaries going to answer those questions differently than the people who do? Possibly. If you only care about talking to your company's current customers, you have it a little easier, because then you can just use your customer database. But that probably only includes people that just registered their product, and there are plenty of customers out there that didn't. Are the people who registered going to answer differently? It's very possible. This kind of problem can introduce coverage bias, which is where your list doesn't draw, evenly, doesn't draw from the population. Once you have your list, though, you're ready to take a sample from it. And the gold standard of sampling is the random sample. sample. But even this can cause issues. For example, what if some people have four phone numbers and some people have only one? The person who has four phone lines is four times as likely to end up in your sample. Are they going to answer the question that you ask differently than the people who have just one uh, phone line? Hello? 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 Maybe. This is called sample selection bias. And this is what happens when your sampling method doesn't draw evenly from the population. You know, the real way to get around this is just not even bother with this population nonsense. Just find some convenient people that are willing to answer your survey, you pay them, and you publish. Are you worried about this? Don't be. It happens all the time. Half the research into human psychology is based on the assumption that everyone in the world acts just like an American sophomore college student. That's weird. Don't do that. When you draw your sample, you need to make sure that the sample is big enough. That way, you can be confident that the points of view of the population are represented in the sample. If your sample is too small, you can end up with sampling error, where your results get drowned out in random noise. Finally, if you can avoid all these biases, you're ready to ask your question. So you pick up the phone, you start making phone calls, and some people are going to answer your question very patiently, while other people are just going to hang up. Are the people who hang up the phone different than the people who answered your questions very patiently? Are they going to answer the questions differently? Maybe. This is called non-response bias. All right, so let's talk for a minute about how these principles led to the election of US President Landon in 1936. You all remember President Landon, right? In 1936, Literary Digest, the famous magazine, did a poll which they claimed reached one quarter of all the registered voters in the United States. Huge sample size. Can't fail. Based on the results of their poll, they concluded that Republican Alf Landon would win a solid victory, and Roosevelt would pretty much get thumped. Now, what actually happened was Landon won only two states, Maine and Vermont. In terms of electoral votes, it was eight for Landon, 523 for Roosevelt. There are a couple sources of bias here. 
Number one was coverage bias. Their lists came from their subscribers. Car owners, telephone directories. Remember, this is the depression. Not everybody had a telephone or car or could afford to subscribe to some hoity-toity literary digest. But even more importantly was non-response bias. For whatever reason, the land and voters were just more likely to send in their survey. I don't know, maybe they had more time on their hands that they weren't going to the soup kitchen. After this humiliation, the magazine collapsed, never to be heard from again. Thank goodness, in America, we've moved beyond. We've learned our lesson. We have so much more sophisticated ways to be wrong now. <laughs> it's true. They didn't call this election. So what should we take away as the public? One is that there are limits to the power of data. These publications were claiming a lot more confidence than they should have. I can kind of understand why. They got the outcome right for four elections, and they called it pretty close. The second thing is that they built complicated models on top of the polls, and those models blew up on their, in their face. The polls were actually just as accurate as they had been the previous four times. It's just that the models were way different this time. And what's a model really other than an opinion embedded in mathematics? How much trust should we have in that opinion? Is the model transparent? Can we double check its assumptions? Computer models are being used for so many things these days, including figuring out who gets a job interview, which teachers get fired, and even who gets a home loan. Are we sure that they work? Well, I mean, the home loan thing worked out pretty well, didn't it? Ooh, it might be too soon. <laughs> We also have to think about how the public received these claims, how they were understood by the public. I mean, an 85% chance means that a sixth of the time, one out of six times, it goes the other way. I don't think the public thought about it that way. So while I wish they'd done a better job of modeling and communicating, I think it's healthy that they failed in public. We can learn from their mistakes, because we try to model something, we try to make a prediction that might be true or not, and if it's not right, then we adjust. I think there's a lot of adjusting happen happening right now, and I think that's good. I think this is how we make progress. Progress. Got it. <laughs> the takeaway for me is just don't make any predictions that can be disproven. Stick to something like this. Four to five dentists recommend sugarless gum. Man, if you can get a dentist to recommend candy, you're set. So how did they do it? Well, it depends on the question you ask. These dentists were asked, would you recommend no gum, sugarless gum, or sugary gum for your patients who already chew gum? Now, dentists might have preferred no gum, but they, maybe they thought, you know, they're already chewing gum, maybe I'll just nudge them in the right direction. I don't know. Either way, they got the result they wanted. So, in summary, if you want the surveyed data that you're looking for, start with a population that's already going your way. Ask them one of those special questions, like the one about gum, and you know, you can use that small sample size to your advantage by repeating your survey over and over. Sooner or later, you're going to hit the jackpot. You can say, a survey finds for my product. You don't have to tell them about the ones that didn't. OK, so you got your data in hand. How are you going to use it? How are you going to extract the most value from it? Statistics. OK, that's the first thing that you've said that I can agree with during this entire talk. Well, thank you. One of the most important reasons that you use statistics is to summarize. You may have thousands of distinct observations, and each one has its own story. This can be totally overwhelming. Summarizing lets you keep the gist of what the data is trying to tell you without getting distracted by errors and noise. Of course, summary statistics also hide the complexity of your data, 
So you have a responsibility to make sure that your summary, summary accurately captures the true nature of the underlying data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the good news for you prevaricators is with a little help from statistics, you can tell any story you want. I'm going to tell you a story about averages and about teachers. As you might know, a couple years ago in Seattle, where I live, we had a teacher strike. The teachers went on strike for higher pay, longer recess, and less focus on high-stakes testing. This is what it looked like on the picket lines. Now, if you'd been in my house, you would have seen a different picture. Luckily, as a parent, I know how to take advantage of these teachable moments. So the question we want to ask is, how much were those teachers making on average? Well, the average teacher made $49,000. Oh, wait. No, the average teacher made $59,000. Actually, the average teacher made $69,000. There's a lot of information out there. You can kind of take your pick. One question is what data is included in the average? And another is, what average are they using? There are actually three kinds of averages. There's the mean, median, and mode. The mean is what people usually are talking about when they say average. And that's what you'd get if you took all the teachers' salaries, added them all up, and divided by the number of teachers. There's the median, which is the middle value. So if you take all the teachers' salaries and sort them, take the one in the middle, there's your median. And half the teachers make more, and half the teachers make less. Finally, there's the mode, which is just the one that appears most often in the bunch. In a normal distribution, the mean, median, and mode are all the same. A normal distribution is what you would get if you gave your kids a standardized test and then stacked up their brains according to how they scored. A normal distribution is kind of shaped like a bell. It's symmetrical, it's tall in the middle, and it flattens out on the edges, what are called the tails of the distribution. But the problem with using averages for salary data is that salaries are almost never normally distributed. So the mean, median, and mode are going to come up with different answers. Let's take a look at some data. So here's a chart of all Washington State employees' salaries, not just teachers, but they're in there. Notice there's a huge spike between zero and $10,000. That's probably part-time workers. They, our data set doesn't differentiate between part-time and full-time. Also notice that there's kind of a hump on the left and then a long tail to the right. It's not symmetric. So our averages are going to come up with different values. So let's start. The median is $36,000 a year. The mode, oh, sorry. So half, the t t uh, half of the employees make less and half the employees make more. The mean is more than 10% higher at $40,000 a year. All of those part-time workers barely count for anything in the mean, but they count for a lot in the median. Well, what's pulling that mean up? Well, part of it is that the most commonly occurring salary is $55,000 a year. But even more important is this long tail. There are thousands of employees of Washington State who are making more than $100,000 a year. And the more that they make, the more that they count toward the mean. And this long tail actually keeps going and going and going. Wow, way to beat the averages. Let me give you one more anecdote from this war of statistics. How would you like a job that pays average salaries and benefits exceeding $90,000? For the average US household, median income 51939 this might seem attractive. But for Seattle's unionized public school teachers, it merits enough outrage to go on strike. I love this. In three sentences, it manages to compare apples to oranges three different ways. First, as I'm sure you noticed, it's comparing the average, probably a mean, to a median. Secondly, it's comparing salaries and benefits on one side to household income on the other side, which doesn't include benefits, but might include multiple earners. 
And thirdly, it's comparing the U.S. as a whole to Seattle, which is a booming city struggling with a high cost of living. Here's another example. On an episode of Freakonomics, researchers were wondering, do underserved minorities in the U.S. suffer from a lack of sleep? They were thinking about this because they knew that minorities were more likely to have health problems, and they knew that lack of sleep was linked to health problems as well. So the researcher came on the show and said, nope, doesn't look like it. People who identified as white actually got slightly less sleep than people who identified as black. So you're barking up the wrong tree, I'm summarizing, and uh, you're going to have to find something else. A second researcher came on the show and said, did he look at the distribution of the data? Because this is just the average. She broke the sleepers into three groups. Short sleepers, less than six hours. Middle sleepers, thank you, with uh, between six and 11 hours. And long sleepers, more than 11 hours. And the people identified as black were disproportionately likely to either get less than six hours or more than 11 hours both of which are probably unhealthy. So when you use averages, remember that it can hide important things about the distribution, and that your choice of average, especially median versus mean, can slant the message in different ways. You know, another question to ask about this situation, how did that first researcher get into this predicament? How did he get humiliated on a worldwide radio program? He shared his sources. He gave away his data. He let anybody just build on top of it or contradict him. And you know what? They brought him back on the program and said, hey, you know this other researcher said you were wrong? And you know what he said? That's a new finding. That's really neat. Neat? These scientists, it's like all they seem to care about is adding to human knowledge. I think it's Stop. neat. Let's talk about percentages. They can be tricky because they compare two numbers, but we usually only talk about one of them. Here's an article from St. Louis in the recovery and the recession that executives at a company had gotten a 5% salary increase, making up for a 10% cut they had had earlier. Oh, cool, so they made half their money back, right? Let's do the math. So let's say they make $100,000 a year. $100,000? For an executive? That's not very much for an executive type. Maybe they should get one of those cushy government jobs out in Seattle. It just makes the math easy. OK, so let's say they make $100,000. So they lose 10% of their salary, so $10,000, and they now make $90,000. But then they got a 5% boost, so they add $5,000. And finally, they end up with a salary of $95,000. Actually, that's wrong. With percentages, you always have to ask, percentage of what? What's our baseline? So let's do the math again. The first calculation was right, that 10% of our baseline, $100,000, is $10,000 for a new salary of $90,000. But for the second calculation, our baseline is now $90,000. And 5% of that is $4,500. So the new salary it's 94,500. And this effect is amplified as the percentages go up. What if they had lost 50% of their salary and then gained it again? Well, then they'd be down to $50,000, as you'd expect. But the new baseline here would actually be $50,000. So the, a 50% boost then would be only $25,000. So they'd end up with $75,000. So. Minus 50%, plus 50%, equals minus 25%. Only in the land of percentages. Let's take a look at an example from North Carolina. In 2006, there was a disagreement about immigration. On one side, anti-immigration activists were saying that there had been a 700% increase in the Latino population between 1990 and 2006. On the other side, they said that there had been a modest 5.54 percentage point increase in the same time. Somebody's got to be lying, right? Well, no. 
they're working from the same data, and their math checks out. For the first number, the baseline is the 1990 Latino population in North Carolina. By 2006, sure enough, that number is almost 700% higher. For the second number, we're looking at the percentage of the overall population who is Latino. In 1990, 1.16% of North Carolina was Latino. And in 2006, it was 5.54 percentage points higher. And notice it says percentage points. That's a difference in percentages. So the wording is different on the slide. Here we actually have two baselines. The first one is the entire population of North Carolina in 1990. And the second one is the entire population in 2006. So sure, the number of Latinos had gone up in that time, but so had the population of the entire state. So what you have on this slide, though, are not just the claims, but also all of the numbers that they worked from and how they did their math. You can decide for yourself what to believe now that you have all this information. This is great. This is called context. Context. You need to avoid it at all costs. <laughs> Simplify. Simplify. Strip it down to a bumper sticker. And whatever you do, don't give people the time and space to reflect on it, get that system too engaged. No, you gotta keep that infinite scroll scrolling. You gotta keep that 24 hour news cycle going. You gotta keep them in the zone. Right, let's move on. Let's talk about how you figure out if one thing causes another. So researchers had figured out that it kind of looked like cigarette consumption might cause lung cancer. As cigarette consumption went up, so did lung cancer rates. And as cigarette consumption went down, lung cancer rates went down too. People started asking a lot of questions of Congress and tobacco executives, to which tobacco executives said something like, all these numbers moving up and down, that's just correlation. Correlation is not causation. Just because the numbers went up doesn't mean that smoking causes cancer. Did you ever think maybe cancer causes smoking? Well, there's like a 20 year gap, so oh, I don't know. Okay, okay. Maybe there's some other thing. Something that causes people to smoke and also causes cancer. You can't hold me responsible for that. But most likely, these two things are completely unrelated. It's just a coincidence. It can be complicated to prove that one thing causes another. But in this case, researchers ran controlled studies, and they tracked people's tobacco youth and use and their health over the years. And they did show that, yes, cigarette, cigarette consumption does cause cancer. It's not just a correlation. But let's look at another correlation. The New York Times reported that when parents regularly helped with homework, the kids performed worse. How can this be? Well, could it be that if your kid was doing poorly in school, you might jump in and help them more than you would have otherwise? Could this be a B causes A situation? Now, the Times didn't actually give us enough information in the article to figure this out, but it is suspicious. Let me tell you about another finding I just heard about. Did you know that eating ice cream actually causes shark attacks? Do you think maybe it's the, the fat and the sugar that they're attracted to? Or maybe it just makes blood leak out of your pores or something? Isn't it more likely, though, that there's something else causing both of them? I mean, in the summertime, people love eating ice cream because it's hot out, and they do swim in the ocean more in the summertime. Could this be a situation where there's A and B are both caused by a confounding factor? In this case, summertime? Mm -hmm. I will say, though, that if you have more evidence regarding this ice cream makes you more delicious to sharks theory, I would be happy to hear it. Well, if anyone wants to pool their money and buy my co-speaker here some ice cream, we've got a shark reef right around the corner. <laughs> Not so happy now, is he? All right, 
So there's one more result I want to tell you about, and this one has me spellbound. It seems like the harder the words get in the National Spelling Bee, the more people get bitten by venomous spiders. I mean, I can, I can see the relationship, the bees and the spiders kind of moving together. <laughs> I think this one might be a coincidence. There's no reason to think that A and B in this situation are related. So when you see a reported correlation, keep in mind that there might be other reasons than just A causes B. It might be one of these other combinations of things. All right. So let's move on to talk about visualization. This is the Tableau conference, after all. I have a special place in my heart for visualization, because nothing feeds your system one like a picture. Have you ever noticed that some visual distinctions kind of pop out at you, even right out of the corner of your eye? These visual differences are hardwired right into your brain. In fact, some of them are hardwired into your eyes before the information even gets to your brain. That's what I call system one thinking. People like to say a picture is worth a thousand words, but that's not true. As a prevaricator, what you need to know is the picture always wins. If there's any difference between what your words say and your pictures say, the picture's gonna win, because it's got that shortcut. So here's a picture for you. This one's from President Obama's 2011 State of the Union Address, and it shows the commanding presence of the United States in the world economy. The words say that the United States economy is two and a half times the size of China's. What does the picture say? Well, we can measure it. 14.6 on the top, 5.7 on the bottom. Looks like it's legit. The genius of this picture, though, is that the data is only one-dimensional. The picture is two-dimensional. When your eyes look at those bubbles, they're not comparing the widths of the bubbles. They're comparing the areas. So what does the picture actually say? It says the United States is 6.6 .6 times the size of China. USA! USA! Woo! A more honest version of this would look like this. But, I mean, seriously, that wouldn't be nearly as impressive. <laughs> Let me give you another example of how you can add a dimension to your data. Put yourselves for a moment in the shoes of a car marketeer, and you want to show your customers the dominant market presence of your car, the Verna. Now, it might take a leap of faith to believe that customers care about market share, but stick with me here. So you whip this up in Tableau, and you bring it to your boss. She just says, you know, uh, I guess. It's all, wait a minute, why is the Verna that icky greenish yellowish color? Boss, it's a visualization best practice. All these colors are perceptually uniform, so you can compare them side by side. It's got to go. All right, so you go back to Tableau. You've got to cherry pick colors out of four or five color palettes, but eventually you come up with this. It's getting there, she says. The Verna really pops in this one, I like that, but still it doesn't quite tell the story we want to tell. It's not punchy enough. Can you do better? <sighs> so you go back to Tableau again. You're looking everywhere. Where is the 3D pie chart? You can't find it, you've got a deadline. Luckily, Bob in the art department owes you a favor works an all-nighter and comes up with this beauty. Boss, check out how the dark colors in the back just kind of fade into the background. When you look at those wedges on the side, they hardly show up at all. And that big fat lip around the front of the Verna just makes it seem even more impressive. Your boss says, I love it. You are getting a raise. What's more, we're going to make this the centerpiece of our ad campaign. Let's call it the chart buster. Is that a real ad? Oh, yeah. Is that story you told true? No. Oh, well, it sounds very realistic. You know, even regular 2D pie charts aren't very good for comparisons, but 3D pie charts take it to a whole other dimension. Again, 
your eyes see the area of that big yellow block. The perspective doesn't matter here. Your eyes just see the area, and it makes the Verna look even better than it should. All right. Let's, next, let's talk about this chart from Apple. Is anybody from Apple here in the audience? OK. So Apple is a company that's obsessed with making beautiful things. And I have to say, this chart is beautiful. And the story it's telling is beautiful, too. iPad sales are going up and to the right. They must be selling like hotcakes. Tim Cook is a genius. Wait a minute. That says cumulative iPad sales. A cumulative metric, every data point contains all the data points before it. It always goes up and to the right. It's impossible for it to go down. The worst it can do is flatten out. So why don't we get the data for ourselves and plot it without the accumulation? Well, here's quarterly iPad sales. I find this a little hard to interpret. You know, every quarter's a little different. In Q4, people buy stuff for Christmas. Let's apply a moving average that includes four quarters at a time. Oh, that doesn't tell the same story, does it? Clearly, if you want to stand up in front of the world, you want the graph that Tim had, not mine. There's another, there's a few other funny things going on here. Apple's graph is really smooth. How did they do it? Now, granted, they have raw data, which I don't have. Or maybe they applied some beautification function. I'm not right, quite sure. Also, the color changes as you go from left to right. What does it mean? I don't know. Maybe they're trying to draw your way from that slight flattening at the end. Lastly, with retrospect, we can ask, where were those iPad sales numbers going? Oh, sorry, Tim. At least the cumulative metric keeps going up. OK, now we're going to talk about axes. The axes on your chart are really just another pesky form of context. But these days, everybody knows they ought to be there. What can you do? Well, you can start by zooming in on the data that you care about so everyone can see it. They can see how much bigger that 39.6% is than the 35. They've got an axis here. It's labeled with numbers. There's no funny business. I also like the use of color here that just draws your eyes upward. Now, if you tried to reproduce this in Tableau, you'd get something that looked like this. It's another one of those visualization best practices to start your bar charts at zero so people can compare the sizes with their eyes. But don't worry, you can fix it. One thing you might notice if you fix the axis is that Tableau drops a little pin on it as if to say, yoo-hoo, you're lying. But it's OK. You can airbrush it out. OK. We've reached the culmination. We've learned a lot of principles today, and we're going to apply them. We're going to really try to make a better story out of a visualization that I'm, I'm sure you all could agree could use a little help. <gasps> you think that this visualization needs help? Well, yeah. This is one of the greatest data visualizations ever made. OK, check this out. It's made by Charles Joseph Menard in 1869. And it shows a map of Napoleon's march into Russia and his eventual retreat. This tan band is him heading eastward. And it gets skinnier and skinnier. He's losing men all the way. And then the black band is him on his way back. And it's even skinnier now, because he's lost so many men. On the bottom, on the very bottom, there's a, a thin line that shows the temperature going down as winter approaches. So there's so much suffering happening on the way back. This visualization was so effective. Effective? Frankly, I look at this, and I'm like, what's the point? What's the narrative? What conclusion is Charles Mo Joseph Menard trying to draw? And there's so much data here. There's like five dimensions of data. The, the size of the army, I get it. I love it. But it's a map. 
Am I a geography buff? No. And down at the bottom, basically what it says is, it was cold in Russia in December. <laughs> Duh. And up at the top, all, that, all those words, just blah, blah, blah about where the data came from, context again. Only once you get to the very end, the last sentence, do you get this? Napoleon était au choup. For those of you unfamiliar with the French language, Napoleon was a chump. <laughs> Clearly, we got to start all over. What is our story here? Overconfidence, pride going before a fall, hubris leading to destruction. We can all get behind that, right? As long as you weren't a member of the army. Napoleon's disastrous invasion of Russia. And here's our chart. Started with a big army, ended with a little one. Okay, I mean, that doesn't have the crash, the crash of hubris. That's kind of run-of-the-mill chump, if you ask me. What if we take the difference between each point and the next so we can see what events happened? Whoa! Looks like Napoleon had a few bad days at the office. But still, is our story here? Honestly, it's a little confusing. I mean, there's this big spike in July for some reason. And the, yeah, what if, what if we use our buddy the percent? What if we calculate what percent of the army was lost in each one of these disasters? Hey, now this is more like it. This is a chart that goes from bad to worse. It loses 15% of the army, 20%, 25%, and then bam! 50% of the army all at once. I like it. Let's make it an area chart to emphasize those losses. Maybe give it a more appropriate color scheme. Pick out a few points of interest. And for anyone who hasn't got the idea yet, sum it all up. I do like a good pie chart, don't you? But does this really capture the overconfidence? The megalomania? Now it does. <laughs> and on the other end, the humiliation slinking back through the cold to eventual exile. This is what it's all about. Taking your audience on an emotional journey. If you keep the points punchy enough, you can avoid any uncomfortable questions. I have an uncomfortable question. What the heck happened here? How did he lose 200,000 soldiers in the middle of July without fighting a major battle? Well, that's a good question. I have to tell you, in July it was no picnic. There was disease, there was hunger. Every once in a while someone would stub their toe. But a lot of what you saw as red, red, red on my chart was actually de desertion. A lot of the soldiers quit. They went back to France. Some of them stayed in Russia. According to some reports, hundreds of thousands of those men lived out a full life in Russia. You know, that assumption was in Menard's version too. And that tan stripe was red in the original version. That's right. Menard wasn't making this chart for grins to win some award. Menard was an old man in 1869. He had seen war firsthand. He wanted to make a statement about the horror of war. Are you going to tell me, Mr. Goody Two Shoes, that it's never okay to lie with data? You know, I guess it is a little more complicated All than right. I thought. What? Whatever. There's one thing we want you to take away from this. It's that you can't trust anyone. Least of all me, not even Charles Joseph Menard. Not really. We don't want you to be cynical, but we do want you to be skeptical. Skepticism is good. It means you're getting your system too engaged. You have a choice. When you're reading a data story, are you going to accept the conclusions as they're written? 
Or are you going to ask questions? Are you sure that A caused B? You have a choice. Are you going to catch yourself spacing out? Are you going to bring a healthy skepticism with you, even when you agree with the conclusions being presented? You have a choice. Are you going to be aware of the bias you can introduce by the questions you ask, or by your sampling methods? You have a choice. Are you going to tell it like it is? Are you going to follow the data to the truth? You have a choice. Are you going to show your work? Are you going to share your data and let other people build on your work or even contradict you? Are you going to be open to the possibility that you might be wrong? You have a choice. Are you going to make sure that your words and pictures tell the same story? I guarantee you, when you leave this conference, you're going to feel energized. You're going to feel powerful. You have a choice. How are you going to use your power today? Thank Thanks. you very much. If you like this presentation, tell your friends. We're going to be doing it again on noon on Thursday. And I want to point out a few other talks that you might enjoy, including a customer talk from Nationwide Insurance. So check them out.